again. Welcome, everyone. Thank you very much for that, Chris. Um, collaboration is really important. So um, again, uh, I, my name is Camilla. I'm an undergraduate at SOAS. I've been convening this series with a really great group of people. And I'm is... Ellie, and I'm studying global energy and climate policy here at SOAS. Yeah. Um, so again, the objective with the series is to attempt to better understand the ways in which climate change relates to our own and to other societies. Um, and we do this by approaching climate change from the perspectives of politics, development, law, economics, and individual action tonight. So four weeks ago, in our climate change and politics seminar, Larry Lohman discussed the ways in which the politics of climate change have been framed in ways that accommodate to Western points of view, but largely neglect um, the ways in which climate issues relate to the livelihoods of communities in other parts of the world. Three weeks ago, in our climate change and development seminar, Dr. Andrew Newsham of SOAS, he discussed climate change in relation to globalization, and he discussed how it's becoming increasingly crucial to address the discrepancy between those responsible for climate change, um, mostly in the global north, and those most affected by it, mostly in the global south. And two weeks ago, we had climate change and law with Dr. Fair Lesvianowska. She illustrated how classical ideas about the purpose of law are being challenged by the uncertainty and instability emerging in our societies as a result of climate change. Last week, we had climate change and economics with Dr. Harold Hoiban. He highlighted the economic and financial issues of climate change while emphasizing that sufficient action on climate change, first and foremost, requires changes in government policy. So tonight, we have climate change and individual action. Our speakers will share their journey with Solar SOAS and how they successfully campaigned to install 114 solar panels on the roof of the university. They will present their views on the most effective forms of individual and community action and will also bring perspectives from the work they are doing now to inve in investment, law and civil activism. Yeah, and after having explored um, all these different academic perspectives, we do feel it's really important to bring back climate change to our everyday lives um, because that is where it starts. Um, so our, um, the purpose of this seminar is really to have a conversation about that. Um, the four previous seminars have very much been um, a 45 minute talk and then we had a Q&A um, in which we had great discussions, but we want this to be even more participatory. Um, so we have Hannah Izzin Rob, uh, which we're going to briefly present in a bit, um, and they're going to they're going to talk about Solar SOAS, their own experiences. They've been involved in a million different projects. Um, right now, they're doing very different things as well, all related to climate change. Um, so it's really about um, bringing a perspective from people who've really been involved in this um, in many different ways. But we really want uh, we want it to be a conversation. So at any point, if you have questions, please just um, raise your hand ask um, and uh, if you have any thoughts also please contribute um, we really want this to be a conversation um, yeah and so we um, yes and then afterwards we have a reception as we've written here um, to uh, celebrate uh, the ending of a great seminar series uh, with drinks and some nibbles and we hope that you're you can all join us for that as well and continue the conversation or talk about other things that's also fine um, <laughs> We're not going to force you to talk about climate change, no. But um, yeah, and also if you want to tweet about it, uh, use the hashtag climate perspectives, please. Mm -hmm. So now I'd like to warmly introduce our speakers. We've got Izzy, Hannah and Rob here tonight. Izzy studied a bachelor's degree in Chinese language here at SOAS. She graduated in 2016 and she is now pursuing a law degree and has been involved in various environmental projects. Hannah studied uh, BA Chinese and Development Studies and also graduated in 2016. She's currently engaged in many different environmental initiatives, one of them being a cycling group in which she cycled to COP21 uh, in Paris and COP22 in Marrakesh. And she recently secured a job here at SOAS. Rob completed um, a master's in global energy and climate policy here also, graduating in 2013. And he is now working for a crowdfunding investment platform called Abundance Investment, which focuses on renewable energy project projects. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our guest speakers. Switch. Yeah. Is that fine? Yeah. Yeah. Great. 
I really want to stand up. I'll just start, yeah, I'll start standing. Okay, hi everybody. Hello. Hi. Uh, uh, yeah, so my name is Hannah, this is Izzy, and this is Rob, and we're here tonight on behalf of Solar SOAS. We're also here as individuals talking about individual action. So we're going to be talking a lot about our kind of personal and collective journeys uh, in trying to take action against climate change. Uh, and we're going to talk a lot. Of, we're going to talk a lot about um, solar SOAS and how we s how we started as a yes. Okay, so uh, <laughs> this is the correct slide. So yes, this is who we are. Um, yeah. So we're going to be talking about solar SOAS, how it started, what it is that we did, and kind of what we're actually doing now, and the kind of next steps and where we're going. Uh, but we're also going to talk a little bit more about our own lives, kind of personally and professionally, not that personal, but you know, <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, but yeah, so, but like Camilla said, we want it to kind of be more of a kind of conversation slash discussion. So if you have any things you want to add or points of clarification that you want, please feel free to put up your hand. Um, so to hear a little bit more about what it is that Solar SOAS is and how it started, we go over to Izzy. Uh, so thank you for that introduction. Um, yeah, we've already had some great examples on individual action from Chris. There's so many different ways of uh, doing individual action, but what we did started about three years ago when we joined the SOAS Energy and Climate Justice Society. And um, yeah, so this is a student society at SOAS where we would meet up about once a week and discuss different topical issues. So what was the changing international policy at the time, uh, different laws that were coming out, or just go through news stories, really. And it was something that we all really cared about for different reasons. I think we'd already come to SOAS with an interest in the environment and climate and how that could change a lot in the future. And we just got a bit tired of always talking about what was going on in the outside world and these powers that we didn't really feel we had that much influence over. And we decided we wanted to make some tangible change. So the idea of solar SOAS was born and we looked into community energy as something we could bring to universities. And community energy is a form of energy generation and sometimes distribution that is essentially community owned. So instead of traditionally where an organization or a company or an individual buys solar panels, for example, we could have asked SOAS to using their estates fund, just buy solar, solar panels on their own and put on the roof. And then they would control it. They would get the profit from the government um, incentives. And students m might not find out anything about it, like City University of London has solar panels. But if you ask a student, do you know you have solar panels? They have no idea. Uh, so we thought it would be much better to do it with a higher level of student engagement. So we followed the model that they've been doing at Brixton Energy, uh, Repairing London, and a bunch of other places where you get local residents, either in social housing or in villages, to invest by buying shares, or in our case, students, alumni, friends as ours well donated. And then the solar panels are bought through this crowdfunded money and owned by a social enterprise to manage it. So it's owned and controlled by and for the community so that any profits that we make will go into a community fund for more good instead of just, who, know, who even knows? Um, and there's yeah real incentives to get involved in renewable energy then. Obviously being at SOAS, none of us have engineering backgrounds. So you kind of think, oh, renewables sound great, but I've, I don't know, I don't understand how solar works. What, how do we do it? Um, so this is something that we thought anyone could get involved in. Like, as you've been told, we have Chinese and kind of a more of a climate background with Rob. But um, yeah, we just kind of learned as we went along, really. And picked up loads on the go. So now I'll pass you on to Rob to talk about what Solar SOAS have done after we decided we would do something radical. Right, so we were stuck feeling pretty uh, powerless, uh, not knowing what to do, uh, how we're we going to tackle this problem, um, who we were going to ask for help. Uh, so we kind of felt like we were out of our depths, uh, but we got a really good group of people together who were really motivated to, um, to get this going. Uh, it was slow going. We needed to learn a lot about uh, how solar worked, how, um, uh, how to finance it, uh, how community energy uh, works, uh, how 
how different community energy projects uh, structure themselves as different social enterprises or cooperatives, um, how, how to develop the financial model to make, um, to make the project financially viable, um, how to coordinate all, all these different things with different stakeholders, with planning permission, etc. And so it was a lot. It, it took it took a long time, but we managed to get there in the end. Um, we started off by setting out our aims, which was to have a community energy project where students, faculty, staff, and alumni feel like they have a stake in it. Uh, everybody is more aware about the solar panels, about the importance of climate change, and how easy it is to get things going and to start your own projects. Um, and so we looked at different funding options. We started with uh, a social enterprise um, seed fund here at SOAS, where we got 500 pounds to get going. Uh, then we became finalist for the Mayor's Low Carbon Entrepreneur Prize, where we pitched our project uh, Dragon's Den style to a panel, uh, including Dame Ellen MacArthur, Richard Reed, the founder of Innocent Drinks, uh, a couple of um, Big chiefs from Siemens, um, the mayor of London was there, and uh, even though we didn't win, uh, we got lots of really good feedback. We felt like we were onto something, and we we were told about the Urban Community Energy Fund, which was a fund by the government to help community energy projects uh, get off their feet, to fund all the risky stuff uh, for doing all the feasibility work, the technical. Uh, to get a developer on site to make sure that everything is, you can actually install panels, that the roof is um, strong enough, that the grid capacity is good enough, that, um, that there's no planning um, obstructions. Um, we needed legal support, we needed to talk to lawyers about um, the underlying lease arrangements that the university has to see if, if there was capacity for the university to lease, um, lease the roof to us. Uh, all this required um, money, uh, which we didn't have, and which was available through this, um, which was available through this government scheme, which was provided by DEC, which no longer exists, and the fund no longer exists either. But we managed to get there just in time to uh, secure ourselves uh, twenty thousand pounds to do all this work. Um, it really got us organised. Um, we had no idea there was this much work involved into getting uh, getting ourselves started. Uh, we enjoyed it, we learned a lot, um, and in the end uh, we were pretty close with uh, timelines. There was a feed-in tariff deadline. Uh, the feed-in tariff is a government uh, subsidy for if you produce your own uh, renewable electricity, which uh, got massively cut, and we had to install before a certain deadline, which was end of September last year. Uh, otherwise, we weren't going to get that feed-in tariff. We weren't and that would mean our project wouldn't be financially viable anymore. Uh, so we had to make some compromises. We didn't have enough time to do a full share offer, but we did some crowdfunding where we raised uh, just over £2,000. Uh, we raised some investment and a loan from the Students' Union, just above £10,000. And the, we got a massive grant from the university management as well to, per, to uh, install the panels. And in the end, we got our panels, 114 panels installed uh, I think three days before the deadline. Classic, uh, <laughs> classic SOAS. Uh, and now we have uh, what, what were their stats again? 114 panels. 29.6. So the kilo, the capacity is uh, 29.6 uh, kilowatt peak, uh, which equates to 14. Izzy has need these numbers. Uh, 10.22 tons of carbon per year, which um, is quite an abstract number, but that amount of carbon to planting. Beyond that, <laughs> the, so, the solar panels will still be generating electricity, but okay. they're not very; they won't be very efficient. Um, so at that point, you'd be looking at uh, replacing them with um, 
hopefully there'll be much more efficient solar panels by that time. Um, so yeah, we've installed on one roof at, on SOAS, uh, which is uh, the roof above the Students' Union, basically, the old building. Uh, there's, um, there's another larger roof, which is uh, the building where the library is housed in. Uh, we weren't able to install on that yet because the university is going to do massive refurbishments on the windows. They need roof access, blah, 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 massive delays. Anyway, um, hopefully we'll be able to install on there in a couple of years' time. We're already talking to the university about doing a full-on green roof. Uh, with uh, rain water harvesting, um, wildflower planting, uh, and of course the solar panels. And we're talking to uh, University of London to expand our, our uh, installation onto Senate House here as well. Uh, so, small beginnings, but massive, uh, massive opportunities ahead still. Um, then Hannah is going to talk about um, what our next steps are. Cool. So, um, like Rob was saying, it's kind of been quite an interesting journey and not really one that we uh, ever envisaged we'd go on, actually. I think when we started at SOAS, none of us knew what, had never really heard what community energy is, had no idea what it is, and now we're kind of, you know, going full steam ahead trying to kind of spread it everywhere, which is, uh, yeah, it's just interesting where your life goes. <laughs> um, but, yeah, it's also been a very empowering process to kind of go through this whole kind of uh, to go on this journey and to kind of start with the discussions of like, wouldn't it be great if, uh, to actually having them up there and it kind of allows you to think, wow, well, if that can happen, then what other things could we achieve if we put our, put our minds to it? So right now, you know, like Rob said, we're, we've had small beginnings, but we're definitely thinking about how it is that we can kind of grow this project and bring it to other universities. So that's something that we're definitely thinking about now. Um, like Rob mentioned, uh, DEC, which is a Department of Energy and Climate Change, no longer exists. Um, thank you, Tories. Uh, so yeah, and then the Urban Community Energy Fund, which is the kind of key 20,000 pound, you know, pot of gold that like allowed us to check everything that no longer exists in its in the form that it did for us. So right now we're kind of exploring things given this like very um, different financial landscape, but it's not putting us off. So we're still trying, um, but recognizing that these are kind of obstacles to be overcome if we are actually uh, going to be able to spread it. Um, but just to give you kind of like a little taster of the different things that we're like doing right now. Um, well, the first thing is actually next weekend we're going to have a visioning session uh, as an organization. So um, I'm not sure, I can't remember if Rob mentioned it, but Solar SOAS is the name of our project, but we've actually registered as a community benefit society called UniSolar Limited. So UniSolar is all about kind of spreading renewable projects, specifically solar, to different universities. So it's kind of under this umbrella kind of name that we're, we're exploring and talking to different people. So Solar SOAS is just like the specific project. Um, yeah, so some of the other universities that we're kind of in conversation with is UCL. So, uh, you know, they've just newly formed a group who seem very enthusiastic. Uh, and so we've, we're kind of in conversation with the UCL um, sustainability officer who's like very supportive and positive. So that's like a really good sign. Um, so we're going to see where that goes because obviously UCL has lots of different buildings. So if that were to take off, that would be great. Um, another thing that we're kind of doing at the moment is the NUS runs like this campaign called Divest Invest, which is all about trying to get universities to divest their investment portfolios out of fossil fuels and invest that into kind of positive community energy projects. So that's at the moment, I think, kind of faced outwards and not necessarily on universities themselves, but more just like community projects in the world. But the ideal would be if we could kind of divest funds out of university investment po portfolios from fossil fuels, put it into kind of like local on the ground university based community energy projects. I mean, I don't know, that would be quite hard, but that would be great if we if we got there. But anyway, there's a really cool officer from the NUS called Laura, who's currently doing that. And so she and I are very much in conversation. Yes. 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 Yeah. Yes. Okay. I was just wondering how. We were involved in the campaign as well. Yeah. 
Yeah, so um, not so Solar SOS wasn't directly involved with it, but because SOS is very small, many members are part of like lots of different things. So yeah, I think all of us are in some capacity part of the fossil free SOS campaign, as are some of other people here. But that was basically SOS hasn't technically directly divested yet, so they agreed to divest by 2018. So they haven't actually, they just said that that was what they wanted to do. They froze all new investments and agreed to be divested by 2018. Mm -hmm. so maybe yeah. In a nutshell, how mm. uh, we approached the university financial director um, quite diplomatically. Uh, we told them that we are very. Yeah, we, we told them. We we didn't go full on very protesty. We yeah. um, we approached them in a very civil manner and said we are very concerned about climate change. Uh, can you tell us where SOAS is invested, and can we open a conversation on? whether we can divest those funds from, away from fossil fuels. And then we helped them, um, we, we, got, we got them loads of reports on um, how uh, funds that have divested from fossil fuels have done pretty well in the couple, last couple of years, how um, exposure to more renewable energy doesn't lead to greater, necessarily greater risks in the portfolio. And so they took our arguments on board pretty well. It, there was just a lot of um, logistics on how to manage that stuff. Because the university's contracted um, an investment firm to invest on behalf of the university. And it wasn't very easy adding additional filters into um, fund. I th no, so, so this, no, so this is completely separate. We just happened to, that was more, sorry that that's misleading. I, I just put that picture on there because well, it's, it's kind of it's one yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, and also because yeah. we've, yeah, sorry, should have made that more explicit. Basically, um, we've just kind of, the, our beginnings were when we were in lots of different energy related or kind of client, yeah, environment related groups. It's okay, yeah. Um, yeah, fossil free SOAS. So we had kind of two key representatives who kind of dealt with them directly. I'd say another key part of the process was that we actually did have an independent financial audit of you know what the impacts of divestment would be, and the results of that said that there would be no negative impact on um, uh, SOAS's funds. Potentially positive, I think, something like that. And so that was very much key in convincing them. Uh, eventually to agree to divest. So the reason we included uh, that in, in the slide was that um, a couple of us were involved with that campaign as well. And then afterwards, we were like, okay, great victory. Now what? So we started talking about a more, another long-term project. That we could do. Okay. And during those conversations, um, was also known that was to management. about this? We, we also had a UGM, the first thing we did actually was have a UGM motion to demonstrate that there's kind of student support for this action. And then from there we did all the other stuff. Yeah, and same with some of us as well. Quite early on we got a Yeah, important to get a student mandate. Cool. Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, okay, so in terms of just next steps, what we're doing, so yeah, supporting kind of divestment projects and seeing if there are ways that we can link those up with community um, reinvestment is definitely something that we're doing. So NUS is very involved with that. They're actually like directly talking to Sheffield because Sheffield Students Union is really pushing for Sheffield to divest, but also trying to link it up with putting that money into kind of community reinvestment. So I actually have a meeting with them tomorrow, so we'll see kind of what the status is with that, which is exciting. Um, a couple other things that we're doing. Right now, we've actually just written a proposal for the GLA, so that's the Greater London Authority who works with um, City Hall and the Mayor of London. And basically, we're trying to get them to include supporting university community energy as part of their solar action plan. So when City Khan ran to be mayor, one of his manifesto points was to have a solar action plan for London to kind of support developing solar um, projects. But it was like a very vague plan. Um, and they're only right now kind of finalizing it. So we've kind of written a proposal to them to include in that plan supporting university community energy because we think that that, you know, I think that, that would be quite like a buzzwordy, positive project if it took off. And we've kind of said, you know, 
think so, this would be good. There's lots of capacity. We just need these kinds of funds in this way. So hopefully they'll be like, yeah, and then we'll be like, great. Um, and then things will be happening. So, so those are kind of some of the different things. The last thing that we're kind of involved with is there's actually like a network called Community Energy London of loads of different projects um, across London. But at the moment, like they're all happen happening independently and people are going through this process that we've gone through of like figuring out, you know, her heritage consent, just all sorts of weird stuff that we had to go through that like we didn't know at all. So like lots of different projects are doing that. It would be great if we could actually work together and kind of skill share and not like duplicate work. So we're trying to develop a kind of more concrete um, network and platform by which to do that. So we're part of that conversation, which is really exciting, and we're meeting lots of cool organizations through that. Um, and yeah, and just seeing like really positive climate action across London. So um, that's kind of the solar SOAS stuff. I think I'm going to throw it over to Izzy to talk a little bit about herself. <laughs> um, so yeah, with the individual action, I guess what Hannah was just saying about what we want to do is like streamline it and make sure that we're not all just doing little things that we could better do together, coordinated. Um, so uh, yeah, as mentioned, we're going to go through our journeys of individual action on climate change, linking in with solar stars. So solar stars wouldn't have existed and there wouldn't be this case study for reinvesting divested funds into renewables or case study for having community student driven renewables on campus. There wouldn't be this case study if there hadn't been an individual that oh thanks. There hadn't been an individual that kind of put the idea forwards and then other individuals like Hannah as an individual would be like, yeah, yeah, I'm gonna spend my time on this. I'm gonna commit to doing all of these admin tasks and just learning as I go. And it's only as individuals coming together that we've been able to make this change and now there are 114 solar panels that would not have been in existence otherwise. Um, so another uh, aspect of individual action that I think is quite important, it's not everything, but it can be important, is careers. So how do our careers affect uh, climate change and the climate movement? What can we do in terms of our skills and education that helps push forward this movement? Um, and uh, I am now training to be a lawyer, and I kind of got there because of solar stars. So quite early on, we needed some free legal advice on what kind of social enterprise to set up as, because there are some different legal structures. And free legal advice is quite hard to come by. But there was a firm called Simmons & Simmons in the city who mostly do commercial law, but they also set up a charity that helps community energy. And they do loads of great work with renewables. And one of the partners there just agreed to meet us, give us some advice. And uh, yeah, we're all quite impressed with the law firm and their work. Um, so as I was in final year of Chinese thinking, what do I do? <laughs> I'm gonna graduate, what do I do? Um, and. I'd been previously applying to loads of like wildlife conservation charities, green charities, sustainability officer stuff, and getting nowhere. Um, Chinese degree isn't super relevant for those <laughs> things. Um, and I didn't have like environmental science, uh, but there is such a thing as a law conversion. Lots of people with languages go into law. So I met up with that partner who gave us the free advice and um, he gave me loads of great, adv great advice. I applied for a training contract with Simmons & Simmons, that law firm. Um, so now they're funding me to study law and then I can work for them for two years as a trainee and get lots of experience in all sorts of things, including working with renewables on the commercial contracting side and as well learning about banking and finance and it, the inside of the system. So it's good to have an understanding to change the system from the inside. Um, and then after that, I'd like to specialise in environmental law more directly. There are Lots of really cool organisations like Client Earth, which is a charity with activist lawyers who do things like sue the UK government. Um, so first I'll start off by helping renewables and then maybe I can just like sue BP and Shell <laughs> until they are destroyed. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so it's kind of start off gentle and then get a bit more antagonistic. Um, because, yeah, there's a time for both. Like we were saying how the fossil free and solar SARS approaches were very kind of collaborative. And um, when you approach with like a friendly, um, proactive idea, often there will be a good response. 
but then on other levels sometimes it's fun to be a little bit more antagonistic like we also attended um as solar so as and as a university the huge climate march in london um so you're kind of going from all angles um so yeah one day working as an environmental lawyer would be cool and tying that into what i did at my time at soas uh, how many of you are at soas now or were at soas okay quite a few cool. how many are at other universities also a few cool mm -hmm. um yeah so hannah and i both studied chinese and um i guess because i'd always been in, interested in animals and wildlife conservation i tried to link that to my environmental interests by in second year in in China on our year abroad, I did my research project on changing Chinese attitudes towards wildlife and wildlife conservation. And then when I came back in third year and we were just still doing loads more language tests and I thought like, climate change is happening, I should be learning about that and doing something about that, not just learning about different kind of sentence structures. Um, but yeah, with any degree, you can kind of tie it towards what you feel is more pressing. So. I took an optional module in environmental law, which was really interesting, and I was able to do my environmental law research essay on the role of NGOs in China in improving access to environmental justice, so more of the kind of public interest litigation things where like, charities are suing local environmental bureaus or corporations that are um, going against, like they're breaking the laws on pollution, but with such a big country it's really hard to, for the central government to monitor accurately and actually make sure that the laws are being enforced so public interest litigation has a good role there and as well i did my dissertation on um you could link it to climate change it's more broadly environmental but i did it on chinese eco cinema as a social and ecological critique of modernity um on this documentary that followed an um ethnic minority like small tribe in the north of China in the forest uh, where it's almost kind of like Siberian climate and they used to live off reindeer hunting and moose hunting and now their complete way of life has changed as a result of environmental change and um, yeah there's like massive rates of alcoholism of just like their lives falling apart because there was this really important human nature connection that has been affected by government policy by poachers by wider changes that's kind of making everyone conform to one sort of system and enter capitalism, whereas before they were quite self-sufficient. Um, and that is the case with lots of different small island nations and people around the world who uh, had held on to what I think is really important, the human nature connection and actually realizing um, how our actions affect nature and how how dependent we are on a healthy natural system and a healthy ecosystem. Sometimes it's easy to forget living in a city you can buy something and have no idea what happens then. But um, yeah, so <laughs> rambled on about my dissertation. But um, yeah, you, you can make, even if you're doing something that's not related to climate change, you can always link it because everyone's, like everything is linked to climate change so in one way or another. As well. you, it helped you with, um, with doing kind of dialogue where you Oh yeah, and I, I, yeah, I interned for a website that publishes bilingual Chinese-English environmental news. So it's working with the Chinese government and working with Chinese organizations and journalists on you know, sharing information and sharing knowledge on like how different, how things are changing, how laws are changing and how different people are bringing about different solutions. Um, is also a hardcore vegan? <laughs> um, yeah, so yeah, individual action, I guess that's one of the ways. Um, there's lots of um, important documentaries and stuff you can do. Hannah talked about, um, I was going to talk about flying. And um, the other thing that Hannah and I did while we were at SOAS was we ran for environment officer of the student union, which is a part-time student position. And we got it and together we were able to make a few changes at SOAS, uh, including um, selling loads of like keep cups, like the reusable tea cups and it's reusable subsidized. water bottles. Oh yeah, subsidized. Um, and also raising awareness. Like we organised loads of talks. Like there was one from a UN senior professional who came to SOAS and talked about climate change in the Middle East and North Africa region. Um, I organised an interfaith dialogue. So we had some um, Jain nuns, some a, a Buddhist nun, um, someone from a Christian charity. 
a Jewish climate campaigner that we know, and someone, Hare Krishna, and a bunch of different people talk about, actually, if you look in kind of every religion, there is something you can take that is useful and indicative of the importance of taking action. Um, and I recently met some people who got community solar panels up on a church. The Church of England is quite friendly towards community energy. So even though it might seem hard to get planning permission, having these solar panels on a roof of a church, it's happened in North London. Um, other things that we did. Yeah, that's about it, really. Yeah, and just individual action. Um, um, I think it's important to have a community, even though individual action suggests kind of doing things alone. Like, I was only able to get a lot of stuff done, and I felt empowered to do things and make changes in my own life because I could see so many other people around me doing it. And through the SOAS Green Group and Solar SOAS, I had like a community of friends who also cared about this, and we could all talk about our worries and learn things from each other. And um, yeah, just having that network and that support base was really, really helpful. Um, and as well, you can achieve more when you work together. So that's why we focus so much on community action in a talk on individual action. Um, and you can make a community out of anything, really. Um, so yeah, so now I'll pass on to Rob and what he's doing. Right, so I'm working for uh, a company called Abundance Investments. Uh, we enable people to tackle climate change by uh, allowing them to take their money out of uh, fossil fuel investments or other unethical investments and put it straight into a website, effectively a crowdfunding website. Investments, uh, so people donate what they on their investments. And it's a big responsibility in managing people's money to return on uh, We enable people to do renewable energy projects as well. Uh, we now we are now allowed to investment into supper as well, so millions of people get free. And hopefully, by doing so, we're democratizing uh, finance and making it easier. Um, you can invest into energy projects through our platform from as little as five pounds per project. Um, Capital risk. Every investment carries risk. <laughs> so, how did I get into this? Um, I first studied um, an undergraduate in national relations and development studies at Sussex. Uh, it was great. I really enjoyed myself. But afterwards, I felt lost uh, to with myself. I ended up working as a ballet host in the French Alps. Uh, <laughs> and every time I was hungover on the lifts, I had some time to think to myself of what I want to do with my future. <laughs> Uh, I did quite a bit of reading and I really, really felt uh, passionate about environmental issues and how they interact with loads of other um, social and environmental politics in economics and in, 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 in everybody's lives in general. And so I found uh, this master's at SOA, climate policy, a really good teacher. Well, I think I really enjoyed it, and aside from academia, I want to get active as well, uh, which is why I got involved with the uh, Climate Justice Society, also Free SOAS, and of course also Solar SOAS. And uh, from Solar SOAS, having all that experience in, um, in developing my own project, I came across um, this job role at the
basically in the first year. Um, but yeah, so my I'd say that my kind of view has become a lot more local uh, when I was younger. Cause I, grew up, I was very much an international organization about like global level, which I do think like kind of global policy. But um, now I actually find local tangible projects. Like Um, so that's yeah, kind of development in my stuff. Um, but like Izzy, I kind of managed to make lots of different things. And I did a project in policy. They're very, very developed this like, program, but not because they have effective Instead, because the value of the materials is so high that it means that first people in that their income is to collect people's rubbish and then to very diligently separate it out and sell it on. And so while the value of those materials from your own is high, that's going to be a good policies on. And my uh, dissertation was also on China's coal policies, how they've completely changed five years line with kind of thinking of so actually trying to be progressive in a way that well, I don't want to say completely progressive, but like it's you know, people like to Anyway, in terms of uh, what I'm doing right now, I've actually Solar SOAS has led me to get an interview with Reed Howard in London. I think it's a on Monday, um, so very, very new, but Repowering London is all about setting up community energy. Um, so definitely would not have heard about this. Or Actually also just yesterday, um, got a job at Silver. So all cha big changes this week, so lots of things happening, uh, and definitely all very much linked to a couple of other things I just wanted to mention that you know, I'm currently working on a campaign with 350.org called Divest Parliament. Um, and so this is working to try and get the uh, pension fund basically like a 600 million uh, which until very recently there was no information about what it was invested in at all. They didn't have to. Several MPs have kind of asked them to just disclose But very, very recently they have this was like the top 20 investment first as expected. Uh, so the campaign is trying to get that to change, and the way in which we're doing that is we're trying to get low over oh, trying to get people to contact their MP. So if it's hey, hey, we've got this campaign, support this campaign, say that you want to actually in the world in general. Um, there, there's quite an interesting relationship between savers and pension funds. At the moment, people who save in a pension fund don't actually have a direct role. Historically, it's been a very separate relationship. I think the same thing is finances. Yeah, I think it's interesting to think about that, and that's the whole we don't want our money invested in you know, bad things in society. Happens. Um, so yeah, the the campaign is really interesting. We've got about forty-five-ish MPs who kind of spoken out in support of it so far. But if you, I really strongly encourage you to check out the website Divest Parliament. It takes like one minute. You know, very effective way. They have to respond to you if you're their constituent. You have to include your your uh, address in your email. They will have to. And actually, if you want to meet up with them, they, very few people know this, they actually will have to meet up with you. <laughs> um, so for this campaign, we did a very interesting training about how to, how to speak to your MP, up with them, the ways in which to try and convince them of things. It's, and I actually think everyone should do this training in general for talking to anyone in authority, because it was all about uh, uh, behaviors to expect. So MPs or anyone in, in authority, if they have to meet up with you, will employ a lot of methods 
trying to kind of deflect the conversation. Basically, their goal is to like get to the end of it without actually promising. So it was all about like how to um, kind of keep it on task and keep things very, um, yeah, trying to get through. Uh, yeah. So anyway, encourage you to check out that campaign because uh, it's I think it's a good one. Um, the last couple things I want to talk about. One of them is about the cycling group that I was part of or that I am a part of. It's called Time to Cycle, and they're basically like a bike activism um, group. Uh, so they do lots of cool things kind of at the moment as well. We uh, recently have done a lot of tree planting bike rides where we cycle to Surrey or wherever um, as a group, which is really fun. Group cycling is great if you've never done it. <laughs> and especially we often play music, so it's really good. Um, so we cycle to Surrey, Plant some trees here, wait for the beard to wear off, cycle back. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's really nice. So if you're into kind of environmental kind of small actions or whatever, definitely check it out. Um, but that's another kind of like community based thing which I think um, Last thing I want to talk a bit more about was kind of individual action. So I'm not going to say, you know, tell you about like you water bottles or cycling, although you know the the kind of typical things that people say. A lot of them. I did want to mention two, which I think are a little less well known, um, but definitely very effective. And one of them is about thinking about using a green energy provider in your home and like wherever you're renting. But ha did, does anybody do that here? Yeah, so there's definitely lots of potential there. Like it seems, um, it's, I think whenever you move in, you have to kind of set up that either kind of, you know, contact the electricity provider. Well, basically you take over one of the existing electricity provider, mm -hmm. or you can choose to switch to another one is, is Majority of um, rentals, however, uh, will be getting their energy provided by like the B6 energy. All mainly use their electricity, and they also kind of operate a kind of they kind of control prices a lot. Um, but there, there do there a lot of other kind of independent providers exist. Will invest their money in. them are also involved in like green gas. So uh, if you want to do this, I'd highly recommend it. It's so easy to, to do and then obviously it has switched. that's it. And it's also, I think, maybe cheaper. You save money. So it doesn't make any sense why you shouldn't do that. And sometimes if you kind of will, sometimes, um, anyway, yeah, you do that. The website is called, uh, one uh, helpful website for that is um, Green Energy Marketplace that compares all the different ones because there are quite a few now. Um, I think we all use different ones. I use Octopus Energy. Um, because it's so cheap. Um, <laughs> but then um, previously I was with Good Energy. Yeah, they were good, and it's all like Good Energy as well as um. Also, Wind Farm, not too far away. I'm with uh, Bulb Energy. It's your responsibility to kind of set up the provider, and so probably when you moved in, there are people who are already or at least inform them of they're gonna have they they charge you directly. There are a few places that have control. Over it. Always, unless you just pay a lump sum. And then the manager that stuff works. But if you in most rented places go in and people have to take over the water bill, 
And in that process, you can find out like, oh, we were previously with them. And then it's very easy. You just you, you basically tell the new energy provider you want. I want to switch to you. For you, they basically they sort it out with the old energy <coughs> provider. You don't really have to do much. Um, and then you get bills from. We don't know maybe. Yeah. Okay, well, um, Mostly not. I think um, if, you, if you're a new tenant, unless the landlord has a contract, uh, the previous tenant's um, contract is broken. So effectively, you, you have the right to start. I'd just be that if you want to file and you already started up house or something, you might have agreed to want to change you move out, then you pay them. And if it's your own I think with the, I don't know about the green energy suppliers, but I don't think they stick on. Staying with us, but he's paying us for the Those are often have very nice. <laughs> that was one thing that I wanted. Yes. That green energy. Also, the thing is, like, you're not actually directly using. All mixed together. But you're not, you know, going to the shareholders. So that was one suggestion. The other kind of thing that I wanted to mention. Is actually only in the past few months is it um, one of those things that I'm not talking about, but it's such a huge so that flying and kind of aviation and shipping, either of those kind of huge um, so that's crazy. <laughs> and they're predicted to increase. Yeah, so basically, you know. We know that we, we, already, we already think that the Paris Climate Treaty is kind of like the base level that we can, like, as in we need to, it needs to be a lot kind of stricter than that, but that that's kind of what it is, and also we're probably not going to achieve that. But the thing is, like, all aviation emissions are going to be on that, and at the moment, I think aviation, aviation in particular, is kind of between 2 and 4% of our global carbon budget. It's predicted to kind of increase to 20% of our, not our global carbon budget, our carbon emit, the total amount of carbon emissions that we need. At the moment it's 2 to 4%, it's going to be 20%, and that 20% is not being included in any kind of carbon emissions cutting targets. Okay? And so I think that the choice to not include aviation in any of these targets is, I think, multifold. One of them is, um, I think every country wants to be a transport business travel hub that and also I think it's awkward about you know which country gets that. Anyway, so it's not included so that's just like I don't really know how that's and also alternative fuels there's no way that you can kind of reduce the amount that's needed to keep an airplane in the sky beyond as in you can't I, I read about it a while ago so I can't talk about it. But, um, but basically there's no way around it you need a certain energy to keep that in the sky, that produces a certain amount of carbon. Um, and so, yeah, we really need to kind of really strongly reassess our relationship to flying, like our individual uh, relationship, because the thing is, if we are people who are like involved in action, but we fly that a lot, at all, that then 
Yeah. yeah, so um yeah, so I it's a really difficult one because I know that um yeah, I know that people kind of you know, very international international lives, but in terms of looking at like our personal carbon budget, which I strongly suggest people do and kind of consider the different aspects of their lives, but how much carbon one kind of long uh, round trip, long haul flight, that's like almost your personal carbon budget for the year alone in one day. So, it's pretty dire once you start like looking at it. Um, so I strongly urge you to consider it. I um, recently decided that I would only take, I know that this sounds so many, but basically like I, my mom lives in Hong Kong and she's I have to go there to see her. So I, my personal pledge is to only do that one flight. So actually when I went to Marrakesh and then when I came back, I didn't fly. I took six days traveling over Morocco and then uh, over Spain and then by sea um, from Santander to Portsmouth. And then by so, uh, but yeah, it, it kind of changes the emphasis of like what, I, I don't know, it changes the kind of dynamic of what it is a trip is, you know? It's not just about like, I want to get to that really far away place and then enjoy it there. It's like the journey. Um, journey is half the fun. Exactly. So uh, perhaps next time I go to Hong Kong, I could Siberian Railway, that's an option. Um, but yeah, so something to think about. Flying is a thing. I really think that more needs to be emphasized on this point. The brushed off is like a kind of an awkward, but it's there and it's going to continue to be Flying is going to, uh, I heard that flying over. I, I, Whatever. It's music. I don't want to say facts that are, are inaccurate. Alternative facts. But, yeah. So um, yeah, flying. Think about it. Think about reducing it. Think about. Um, so I'm not going to go into this um, in the interest of time. Uh, just going to say that. Um, We've created a toolkit for other people to start a community energy project at their university or in their local area, and. Um, We've uh, got a PDF, it's uh, on our website at uni-solar.org. Uh, you can download the PDF, read through it. Uh, it's got some, just uh, basically some key pointers to send you in the right direction. Um, we will happily talk to you at the reception about it as well, if you want. Uh, but in the interest of time, we're going to move on to the next bit. Um, Izzy. Okay. Uh, so, we talked to you at length about our own lives and our own environmental and now it's your turn. Uh, so get in pairs with whoever's close to you, or threes, or just yeah, find someone and ask your neighbour what their biggest source of carbon emissions is in their life. It might vary according to the kind of lives you leave, but um, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. talk for a couple of minutes. Yeah, yeah. 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 
Has everybody had a chance to discuss? Uh, right, uh, we just want to go through any volunteers for the What for what they think are their largest emissions? I'd like to share. No pressure. It's not about pointing fingers, it's about it's an alcoholics or not. <laughs> I'm Izzy and I took a lot of long haul flights this year, which completely undoes the good work that I did by being buying less stuff and having green energy. For long haul flights. Any other confessions? because the cost of it doesn't at all reflect like the cost. I guess it's technically like the thinking behind having the pricing. Because yeah. um, at the moment it means that you're kind of, you know, health things like that. Reality is like a lot of people think. Anybody else? Flying as well. Also, the kind of thing that like, very small segment will have, but will be twenty percent of the carbon budget. So you can whether the Green Party actually has a very interesting tax idea of like trying to tax flying, um, but to have it not be just like a blanket tax, but instead, the more you fly, the bigger the tax gets to try and kind of uh, disincentivize the people. Who want to fly. Okay. Thank <laughs> you. 
Also, like not black and white. Right? Baby yeah, steps. Sometimes. Baby steps. Yeah. Um, so, I really love the like kind of structure. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, absolutely, the world's not going to change by that. I do think it's important to try and have action on every level. So it's like keeping things consistent, like voting. Also, have we implemented that in your own life? Anybody else? 
guys in the back, any ideas? So sometimes it seems very daunting, but it's always very, very quick and easy. Also makes sense. Chris? Yes. We actually have um, a whole kind of response box of ways in which trust whatever it is that they're trying to tailored to all the potential, kind of, all the responses that we've had so far. Um, of the we've kind of like anticipated. Yeah, it's also good if you do. Is like there's a way to also let us know that you've done that so that we can actually progress it what the status is of that okay, the floor is the floor is open yeah, okay. <laughs> first question was how to reach people that aren't already current. Um, yeah, I guess this is something that um, we've also even thought about in terms of like when we, for example, when we were environment officer and having events, same people would come every If we have a film screening about the documentary about climate change, it's the same five people <laughs> care about climate change. Um, so yeah, I'd say it's a very difficult question. I know um, slightly but recently this really interesting documentary or sorry mockumentary came out called uh, Carnage which is a really really funny movie set in a like utopian future 2067 when everyone's vegan but they don't call it vegan anymore that's just the normal they instead look back to the past when people were carnage carnist and they it's a kind of a really funny take on looking at how people's perceptions have changed it's all about I think they're kind of talking, uh, people kind of confess to having been carnist or to having kind of eaten animals. And they very, need counseling to get Yeah, so that kind of thing where it's like quite accessible and like really fun. It's just a funny movie. So trying to kind of pull people in in different ways that aren't, that aren't quite like um, dogmatic or... Yeah, or like trying to kind of push a message down people down people's throats, because the second people can tell that you're doing that, and then they switch off. Uh, I think the key thing is to frame it in the way that they will understand, in the way that it affects them, um, especially for the younger generation. They like going to go for a walk with a family in the woods in nature. I frame it in such a way that in the future, I might not have as much. 
um, and these are just the why, uh, and this is what you can do about it. Basically, framing the message in a way that engages them and makes them feel passionate about it as well. I'm going to chip in as well because I think that's a really a few things. So, a couple of answers. Um, there's an organization called Climate Outreach who's done a lot of research on this and they brought out this report on how to talk about climate change to people. At the minute, it's kind of seen more as like a left issue, but it affects everyone regardless of your political leadership. So it's like, right, so we found that it was effective engaging people who were traditionally both conservative by talking about waste and like how to reduce waste, which is doing things in the most efficient way possible. Um, I personally think that's a bit frustrating and shallow, so um, I think it involves a bit of a bigger picture and really kind of asking people on an individual and a group level, instead of just following the status quo and doing what is expected by society, like, what do you want from life? What do you want out of your life? What actually matters to you? And how happy can you ever be if you know that there are people suffering in other parts of the world? How safe will you ever be? Like, climate change is happening and like getting rich and buying all this stuff and having a comfortable home. Like, is that what like what is important? And then people will kind of naturally reconnect with uh, reconnect with themselves and just live in a way that is more sustainable because it's, I think that our human nature is Sorry, okay. <laughs> oh, no, I was, no, I was just saying fingers crossed. Fingers crossed, yeah, no, I, think, I don't think like human nature is we're all terrible and want to screw everyone over and destroy our planet. I think if we, act, if we actually connect to our human nature, then we can have the real solution. would normally get defensive and not want to make changes, not want to engage on climate action. But realise that it is important to them. That's effectively one of the reasons we set for us to show people that the issue is real, we're, we're tackling the issue, and we've got something to show for it. Uh, we've got solar panels up on the roof, and now we're reducing environmental footprint. I guess it depends kind of the specific what would be like an act. It would be fun to kind of like take, you know, the, the nice thing about the solar panels is that they're physical and you can have energy tours where we can up and they see them and they're shiny. Um, <laughs> so, so yeah, I don't, I don't know the specific yes, but it could be like a local garden project. Yeah, focusing on like one is lots of research has shown there's only a few people who do respond to doom and gloom and like, bad statistics. I do, but a lot of people I talk to, they don't want to hear that, and they switch off, and um, that may works at 10-10, which is never talk about the polar bears, people don't want to hear about the polar bears, instead talk about, yeah, the kids who are around their schools, or the kind of changes that are more direct to I guess, young people. Yeah. Yeah. Thank <laughs> you. 
Cristo. Okay, we, we, we don't have much time to uh, have, have, have a full presentation now. But, but yeah, we, we very much agree uh, in, in our in our toolkit as well. Um, we, we focused on solar because that's a um, feasible project that we could do here at SOAS. Uh, we, could, uh, we can't install a wind turbine here at SOAS. We, we don't have access to, um, to waves, so we can't do tidal energy here. Uh, but in our toolkit, we help people identify what's, what's the most um, feasible thing for you. Uh, for example, some universities will be in the countryside and have a hill next to them where they can put a wind turbine. Some might have a um, might be close to a small river where they can make small hydro technology. And some, of course, other universities outside the UK, greater, will have greater solar, um, solar radiation as well. So that would make yeah, that, that is one of the things we help for people to identify um, peaceful um, projects for you to pursue. Good point. We're, we're not suggesting that we there is the solution to all of the UK. We also think it's important to support other explorations in and. wind and they do a lot of camping uh, or onshore wind. Um, so kind of thinking about national camping. But your, your presentation sounds really interesting so it would be great to hear about it perhaps at the uh, we know. Do we have time for more questions? Or should we yeah, take so them to the um, I was just have one or two Seeing events really help, yeah. help with the conversation. Anyone else has any kind of projects or or any questions? Yeah. I know there is, there is research going into it, um, not as much as probably, um, but at the moment, as far as I'm aware, uh, there are some biofuels that may be used, or I think some planes already use biofuels. Biofuels also open up some kind of worms, um, depending on how you, the time being, there's Likely reduction in emissions. Basically, I went actually at COP22. I went to a presentation by the International Civil Aviation. They kind of had a very flashy um, kind of presentation on all the research that they're doing into biofuels to kind of say like we've got these really big targets. And basically, I think them as an organization have the target of having carbon emissions from aviation by 2050 by 50% on 2000 some kind of complicated thing which actually is impossible unless they were because the as we were saying like the rate of growth of aviation from now to 2050 is such that like if you were to achieve 50% reduction on carbon emissions 
based on this level of aviation. We have to have like a, a fuel efficiency, something like 90%. I, I don't know the exact figures, but it's basically impossible, especially given that like fuel efficiency gains that can be made very, very small. So I actually think that them saying that they have this goal and them saying that they're doing kind of research into biofuels is in effect greenwashing. And because they have this goal, people are like, oh, it's okay, like flying is okay, we can all fly because we've got this goal. There's no way we're going to achieve that goal. So actually, we really need to kind of re-examine our flying. Um, there, so to, to answer your question, I think there is research going into it, but like, I really, I'm personally not very confident in it at all. So um, definitely do more reading on it. And like I said, I think this is an issue that we need to talk about a lot more kind of as um, but it's Yeah, sure, you get the floor back to you. Great, yeah, no, let's go, let's get the speaker down.